Good morning, everyone. It's Reverend Mike Capron. Uh, this morning, I'm preaching from Luke 15, 11 through 32, the beloved parable of the prodigal son. Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate, like give me my inheritance now while you're still alive. So the father divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered the wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, he was watching, and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This ends the reading of this blessed word. Now, about once a year, I preach someone else's sermon. I find something that moves me by some preacher of the past, and uh, I'm giving them full credit, and I preach it. And today is that day for 2022. Um, this comes from my favorite devotional book, a collection of sermons by Reverend George H. Morrison, uh, who was born in 1866 and died in 1928. Um, he lived in Scotland and uh, did most of his ministry in Glasgow. And uh, the title of this sermon is Refusing to Go In, meaning when the verse 28, when the older son was angry and would not go in to the house or to the party. I have often spoken on this beautiful parable, and I hope to speak on it again. It is so full of teaching and so full of hope that in a lifetime, one could not exhaust it. But now I choose for it, I choose it for a different purpose, and I want to put it in a different setting. I want to look at this brother in the parable as the type of man who will not enter into a love that is too big for earth and go into the household that is home indeed. And he was angry and would not go in. Are there not multitudes in that condition? They see the gleaming of the lights of home, and there is the sound of music in their ears. 
And yet, though they know they would have a welcome, and add to the gladness of all by entering somehow or other, like the brother here, they stand in the cold night outside the door. And, the, and in the window that they see the light and hear the sound of music, they remain outside. And although the night is over them and around them, and though they are hungry and the feast is just there, they will not go in. Let me ask you in passing to lay this to heart, that no one will ever force you in. God is too careful of our human freedom to drag us against our will into his own. You must go willingly or not at all. You must make up your mind to go and do it. And probably there is no hour so fit as just this hour which you have reached now. There are two things about which I want to speak in connection with the conduct of this elder brother. First, I want to look at the reasons which kept him from entering the home that night. Second, I want to find out what he missed because he refused to enter. First, looking at the man, why was it that he refused to enter? I like to think to begin with, that this was in his heart, that he could not understand his father's ways. Doubtless he had always loved his father. Doubtless he had always honored him. He had never before questioned his sagacity or dreamed of thinking him unjust. But now, in the hour of the prodigal's return, when the house was ablaze with light and with merriment, all he had cherished of his father's justice seemed to be scattered to the winds of heaven. Was this the way to receive back a prodigal? Was this not to put premium, uh, put a premium on folly to reward foolishness? Was it fair to him, the older brother, so faithful and so patient, that a reckless ne'er-do-well should have a welcome home like this? He could not understand his father's ways. Is this the only man who has stood without because of irritating thoughts like that? Are there none who hear me who will not enter in because they cannot understand the Father's dealings? They cannot fathom the mysteries of providence. They cannot understand the cruelties of nature. They cannot grasp the meaning of the cross or see the power of the death of Jesus. Am I speaking to anyone who feels like that? who cannot understand the Father's dealings, God's dealings. I want to say to you that the one way to learn them is to come at once into the home. Come at once into the home. For the ways of God are like cathedral windows, which to those outside are dim and meaningless, but only reveal their beauty and their story to those who are within. I think again, this man refused to enter because he was indignant with his brother. He was indignant that one with such a character should have a place at all within the house. It is not likely that he ever loved his brother and perhaps his brother never much loved him. There was such a difference between their natures that they could hardly have been the best of comrades. For one was always generous to a fault and always getting into trouble somewhere and the other was a pattern of sobriety and as cautious as he was laborious. Such Jacobs, uh, and they are found in every region, are always a little contemptuous of Esau's. Secretly they despise them and their singing, and they cannot understand why people love them. And when they find that they are home again and that all the household is in revelry, and then they are angry, and will not go in. He was not only angry with his father, he was also deeply indignant that in the house of gladness a man should be tolerated such as his brother was. And I know many who are standing outside who are angry and will not go in for a reason precisely similar to that. I remember a young man coming to me in Dundee to tell me that he would never join the church. It seemed that in the place of business where he worked, there was a young woman who made a great profession of faith. 
And all the time she was busy attending meetings and acting as a monitor, she was engaged in pilfering the till, in stealing the money of the church. And he was angry, and he would not go in. He was very indignant with his sister, and he said, If these are the kind of people who are in, then it is better that I should be without. And I tell you that there are many just like that who would come in and get their welcome if it were not for what they have seen in people like me within churches, people like some of you who are hearing this now. My brother standing in the darkness there, there is a great deal to justify your attitude. But why do you leave the happiness to us when we are such prodigals and unworthy of it? Come in yourself and come out of the cold tonight. Bring your enthusiasm and your courage with you. And not only will you receive a blessing, but you will be a blessing to us all. I think again this man refused to enter because he trusted the reports of others. He did what is always a foolish thing to do. He went on the information of the servants. Had he gone right in and seen things for himself, the whole thing might have had a different appearance. One look at his brother might have softened him. There were such traces of hell around his younger brother's face. But instead, he went to the stable door where the ostler was loafing and listening to the music. And he, the firstborn of his father's family, was content to get his information there, third hand. Now, of course, we know that he was told the truth. Thy brother has come home and they are making merry. But might not be the truth be told in such a way as would irritate and rankle just a little? It is always the prodigals whom the servants love. It is always the prodigals they like to serve. And there would be just a touch of pleasing malice in it when they told the elder brother what had happened. And so that brother was angry and would not go in. It was partly the servant's tone that made him angry. He took his report of that most glorious night from men who knew nothing of its inner mystery. It is often so, and there are multitudes outside today because they have taken the report of others who are incapable of judging rightly. You are quite sure, no, excuse me, are you quite sure that your reports of Jesus are taken from those who really know him and love him? Are you quite sure that in your thoughts of Christ, there is not some travesty or distortion of what is true. You must especially beware in an age like this, when everyone is talking, and there are a thousand judgments passed on Jesus Christ by men who have never touched his garment's hem. I beg of you to believe that in the gospel, there is something that lies beyond the reach of intellect. There is something which is never understood except by those who have experienced it. And therefore, if you are in earnest and wise, you will take no verdict upon the cross of Christ except the verdict of the man or woman who has experienced its saving power. Enough now on the older brother's reasons. Now will you let me show you what he missed? Well, to begin with, you must all agree with me that the man missed just what he most needed. Think of it. His day's work was over. He was coming home in the evening from the field. Like a faithful servant, he had been hard at work, driving the furrow or building up the fences. I honor him for that quiet and steady toil and for not being above a servant's duty. There would be more prosperous farms and more prosperous businesses if sons today would follow his example. Now, in the now the, however, the labors of the day were over, and he was hungry and needed food. He was weary and he needed rest. His, soil, his garments were soiled with the day's work, and he wanted a change of raiment in the evening, and all that he needed in that evening hour was stored and treasured in his father's house. And yet he was angry and would not go in. He missed the very things he was needing. All that would freshen him and make him strong again. He lost because he stayed outside the door. He was a soiled, weary, and hungry man. And everything was ready for the taking. Yet no one forced him in the taking 
of it when he deliberately stood outside. Is that not always the pity of it when a man refuses the love of Jesus Christ? Is he not missing just what he most needs and needs the more, the more he has been faithful? For all of us are soiled and we need cleansing and all of us are weak and we need strength and all of us are hungering and thirsting and Christ alone can satisfy that hunger. My brother and my sister, I want you to come in, not to please me, but for your own sake. I want you to come in because just what you need is waiting for you in Christ. I want you to come in because that heart of yours is restless and unsatisfied and hungry because when you were tempted last, you fell and you are missing the very thing you need. He did not only miss what he needed, he also missed the merriment and the gladness. He missed what some folk would not miss for worlds. He missed an excellent dance and a good supper. Think of him standing out under the stars, a man alone and out of touch with everybody. Have you not felt it when there was some fine gathering and you were not invited? And then to make it worse, the sound of music floated through the yard and he could see how happy they all were as figures passed by the window. And he was bitten with the fiercest jealousy. He was hurt. He was offended. He was miserable. Everyone was joyous except him. Everyone was in the light but he. And the strange thing is that in all the countryside, there was not a man who would have been more welcome, nor one who had a better right and title to the gladness in the feasting. Ah, uh, what a right some of you have to know the joy and the feasting of the Lord, how you have been prayed for since you were little children, how hearts at home have yearned for you in tears, and yet you are the very one. You have had an upbringing like that, and you stand without and will not go in, and you miss the gladness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to come in right now. You are far more lonely than people think. I want you to have the gladness of religion instead of your petty little amusements. I want you to feel that in the love of Christ with all its strengthening and with all its saving. There is just deep, strong joy that you are missing and always will miss till you pass the door. I am the door, said Jesus, by me. Anyone shall enter if they shall be saved, John 10, 9. Then tell me, did he not miss one thing more? Did he not miss his chance of making others happy? Although I dare say that he never thought it so, his absence was the one shadow on that feast. He was not, I take it, a very lovable person. Perhaps you are not either. He was not at all that kind of man who is the life and the soul of any gathering. And yet on that night, and that night alone, his presence would have been the crowning gladness. His absence was the one dark shadow upon a happiness which was like that of heaven. Do you think that the prodigal brother could have peace until his older brother had come in and welcomed him? Could the father be happy when there was one wanting, one whom he loved and honored for his toil? And all the time, bitter and angry-hearted, the man outside was missing his great chance, a chance that is worth living years to win, a chance of making other people happy. Have you ever thought, young men and women, of the happiness you would give by coming in? If you have never thought of it before, I want you to think of it today. What of your mother who has toiled and prayed for you? What of your father, though he never says much? What of that friend who would be so different if you were but a faithful soul in Christ? What of the angels in their ranks and the choirs who are waiting to rejoice when you are saved? What of Jesus Christ, the lover of mankind, who would see of the travail of his soul and would be satisfied when you came. I beg of you not to miss your opportunity. It is a great vocation to make others glad. 
I would call you to it even if it were hard and meant the sacrifice of what was dearest. But the wonderful thing about our Lord is this, when you trust him, and make others glad in that very hour. You become glad yourself, and you win what you have craved for all along. Amen, my friends. That ends the sermon. As always, if anybody wants to talk about matters of faith, I would be happy to communicate with you. Send me a Facebook message or an email or a call, and we'll connect. And um, I wish you all many blessings this day. Goodbye.